will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider fell into the sea. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider fell into the sea. The Lord my God, my strength, my song, has now become my victory. The Lord my God, my strength, my song, has now become my victory. The Lord is God, and I will praise Him, my Father's God, and I will exalt Him. The Lord is God, and I will praise Him, my Father's God, and I will exalt Him. I will sing unto the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously. The grave is empty, won't you come and see? I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The grave is empty, won't you come and see? The Lord, my God, my strength, my song, has now become my victory. The Lord, my God, my strength, my song, has now Unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. I was dead, but now he lives in me. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. I was dead, but now he lives in me. The Lord, my God, my strength, my song, has now become my victory. The Lord, my God, my strength, my song, has now become my victory. The Lord is God, and I will praise Him, my Father's God, and I will exalt Him. The Lord is God, and I will praise Him, my Father's God, and I will exalt Him. Shalom. I want to start by wishing all of you Chag Pesach Sameach which means we are wishing you a happy feast of Passover. My Hebrew name is Abraham Bentavius, but I generally go by my English name, Todd Lesser, and I am the Messianic Rabbi and Congregational Leader of Adon Alum Messianic Congregation. During our Passover Seder, we will be saying a number of traditional Hebrew prayers. To make it easier on you, we have provided the Hebrew in transliteration for the blessings or if you prefer, you can wait until we say the English translation afterwards. Let's practice some Hebrew to get us in the mood. Just repeat after me. Hale. Hallelujah. Let's put it together. Hallelujah, which means praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We are certainly living in interesting times. Times that I think most of us would never have imagined. We are unable to meet with our congregational family and friends as we normally do. Instead, we will be recording this demonstration Seder for those who want to have a Seder in their homes and for those who just want to learn what the Seder is all about. Seder is a Hebrew word meaning order, and it refers to a particular order of this service that has remained essentially unchanged for thousands of years. What you are about to see will not be all that different from what Jews around the world normally do on this day and what my family did every year at my grandparents' house when I was a young boy. There will be two major differences in our Seder as compared to a traditional Seder. One will be our emphasis on the symbolism in this service that we feel points to Yeshua or Jesus being the Messiah. 
Now, I am not going to tell you with 100% certainty that everything that we say tonight uh, is going to apply exactly the way we say it, but I believe you will come to see a most interesting picture of what God plans, uh, paints for us through this observance. The second major difference in our Seder will be in our include, including a part of the service that was added by Yeshua in his final first century observance of Passover. The vast majority of what you will see tonight will be based on scriptures and traditions that go back to the time of Messiah and before. I would like to give you some basic information regarding terms we will use for the Messiah. Yeshua was Jesus' Hebrew name and means salvation or God saves in the Hebrew. Messiah is the English way of saying the Hebrew word Mashiach, which literally means anointed one. Mashiach translates into Greek as Christos, which in English becomes the Christ. Now the garment I am wearing tonight is called a kittle. The kittle is often worn by the leader of the Seder. And while it is worn on other occasions as a symbol of purity and holiness, on Passover it is worn to represent our deliverance from bondage to a life of freedom. The program we use to tell the story is called a Haggadah, which means the telling. Each year at this time we tell the story of redemption so that, based on Shemot, Exodus chapter 13, verse 8, it is as though each one of us can consider ourselves to have been personally freed from bondage in Egypt. We will be referring to a number of scriptures tonight, both from the Tanakh and the New Covenant scriptures. Tanakh is what the Jewish people call their scriptures based on the names of its three sections. The first section is called the Torah, the, a word often translated as law, but more accurately meaning instruction. Nevi'im means prophets, and Ketuvim means writings. Many non-Jewish people refer to the Tanakh as the Old Testament. We will use the 1917 Publication Society translation for the scriptures from the Tanakh. This is the exact version of the Hebrew scriptures that I had growing up. Now we need to explain some Jewish traditions associated with the Lord's name. When the four Hebrew letters, yud Hey vav Hey are found in Scripture, we will represent them with the word LORD in all caps. If we are pronouncing the Hebrew, we will say the name as Adonai, a Hebrew term meaning my great master. Also, out of reverence, some Jewish people do not fully write out the words LORD or GOD. Instead, a dash is used in place of the letter O. In the New Covenant Scripture translation that we are using for the New Covenant verses, the complete Jewish Bible, we will find that Adonai is used to translate the Greek word for Lord, Kyrios. The two primary places where we read instructions concerning the observance of the festivals of Passover and unleavened bread are in Exodus chapter 12 and Leviticus chapter 23. The Hebrew name for Exodus is Shemot, and the uh, Hebrew for Leviticus is Vayikra. I will use the Hebrew and English book names interchangeably in our service this evening. In Exodus Shemot chapter 12, we read uh, first of the events of Passover, and in verse 2, we find that Passover is to take place in the first month of the year. The Hebrew name for the first month is Nisan, and most of us know that Nisan used to be called Dasan. Dasan. Sorry, I can never resist the chance uh, to use that joke based on the former name of the automotive company that is today called Nissan. Uh, but back to the business at hand. Uh, in Vayikra, Leviticus chapter 23, we find instructions concerning of, uh, the observance of the weekly Sabbath and the seven annual Moadei Adonai. Uh, the Hebrew word Moedei Adonai is frequently translated as Feast of the Lord, actually the Hebrew words, uh, but is better understood as times of divine appointments as the Lord establishes the times that he intends to meet with his people. He calls these times in verse 2 of Leviticus 23, Moedai, meaning my appointed times. 
Let's take a look at what it says in Vayikra, Leviticus 23, verses 4 and 5. These are the appointed seasons of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their appointed season. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, at dusk, is the Lord's Passover. We have come here this evening to commemorate the ancient story of God's deliverance of the Israelites following years of slavery in Egypt. For roughly 3,500 years, the Jewish people have continued to observe Passover year after year because in Shemot, Exodus 12, verse 14, the Jewish people were told that they were to observe this feast throughout their generations by an ordinance forever. Passover's significance is not just historical. Although the miraculous redemption of the Israelites from their bondage in Egypt is a marvelous event in human history, uh, we also see that it is a foreshadowing of the deliverance from bondage to sin for all who would put their trust in the Messiah, who is referred to in the New Covenant Scriptures as the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of all humanity. Yochanan 1 verse 29, John 1 29. Many Jewish people today observe Passover as though it's an eight-day festival combining the feasts of Passover and unleavened bread. Passover is one of the most festive and eagerly anticipated days of all the feasts. The scriptures tell us that in preparation for the seven days of eating only, leavened bread, uh, only unleavened bread, we are to remove all of the leaven from our homes. In Shemot, Exodus 12, verse 15, we are told, Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Howbeit the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. In many Jewish homes today, a very thorough house cleaning is done to remove all chames, a Hebrew word for leaven or yeast, prior to the feast. To ensure that even crumbs are not left, the mother traditionally goes from room to room, sweeping floors, vacuuming carpets, etc. Some think that this might even be the origin of the concept of spring cleaning. Also, cabinets, pantries, refrigerators, and freezers are checked so that all bread, cookies, cake, crackers, etc. containing yeast will be removed from the home. While the mother does most of the cleaning and removing of all of the leaven from the home, Traditionally, it is the father who is charged with the responsibility of verifying that all leaven has indeed been removed from the house. This traditional ritual is called bedikat kamez, which means search for leaven. The search for leaven is normally carried out by the children under the father's supervision. The search begins with a prayer and then a ritual is carried out to help the children to participate in a way that is meaningful to them. A candle, or these days it is sometimes a flashlight, is carried by one of the children. Should any uh, leaven be found, it is swept with a feather onto a wooden spoon by the children and then dumped into a bag which is then burned ceremonially or disposed of so that the father can declare to his family, I have ridden my home of the leaven. Even as leaven or yeast will puff up the food, so also the scriptures often use leaven as a picture of pride, sin, and unbelief. Let us now all bow our heads as we ask the Lord's blessing on this service, and we ask him to help us to remove the sin from our lives so that our hearts would be pure as we begin our observance of this appointed time. May we then be able to say, I am ridden of the leaven in my heart. We also want to pray on behalf of all those who are serving our nation through this crisis, particularly our health care workers and first responders. Our God and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob, we come before you tonight honoring your commandment to celebrate your appointed times. We ask that you would send the Ruach Elohim, your spirit, to meet with us tonight. We desire your presence. And we pray that you would cause the hearts and minds of all who are going to watch this video, all who are in this room, to be able to receive the deeper truths that you would reveal to us this evening. Lord, we thank you 
And we ask you to watch over and protect those on the front lines in our fight against this virus. And we ask these things in the name of our Messiah, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. Now we will kindle the festival lights to start this divine appointment with the Lord. And as we light the candles, we ask the Ruach Elohim, the Spirit of God, to illumine our hearts that he might bring great personal meaning to this, our Passover celebration. As light for the festival of redemption is kindled by the hand of a woman, so we remember that our Redeemer, the light of the world, came into this world as the promised seed of a woman, as it is described in Bereshi, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your word and given us Yeshua, our Messiah, and commanded us to be a light to the world. Amen. 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 Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has kept us in life and sustained us and enabled us to reach this session. Amen. 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 Thank you, Neil. The first element of the Seder is the reciting of the four promises of God to Moses, represented by the four cups of the fruit of the vine, based on Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, which includes the following statements. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, and I will take you to me for a people. The first cup is traditionally called the cup of sanctification. Let us say this line together. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Sanctification means being holy or set apart for service to the Lord. In Shemot Exodus chapter uh, 11, verse 7, God wants his people to know that he has made a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. Similarly, he wants us to separate ourselves from the world around us and be holy unto him. Let us lift the first cup as we sanctify this day and ask the Lord to sanctify us as we say the traditional blessing over the fruit of the vine. Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Borei Peri HaGafen. Amen. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Amen. Let us all drink of this cup, the first cup of Passover. The first cup is traditionally followed by a hand-washing ritual. In Hebrew, it is called urchatz. This is a symbolic act of purification in imitation of the Kohen, the priest, who during the time of the Mishkan, the tabernacle, and the temples would wash his hands in the bronze laver before he offered the sacrifices. This may well be the time when Yeshua washed the disciples' feet as described in the New Covenant Scriptures in Yochanan, John, chapter 13. At this time, I will perform the ceremonial washing of the hands.
actually these days we have a substitute. People sometimes uh, are able to use sanitizer if they're able to find it in the stores. But we did it the old fashioned way uh, for our purposes tonight. We also have the karpas or the parsley because Passover is a holiday that comes in the springtime when the earth is becoming green with life. This vegetable, the karpas, represents life created and sustained by Almighty God. But in this salt water, we are reminded that life in Egypt for the children of Israel was also a life of pain, suffering, and tears. Traditionally, we take a sprig of the parsley, drop it into the, dip it into the salt water, remembering that while our people were in Egypt, much of their lives were spent immersed in tears because of their bondage. Let us say the traditional blessing for the Karpas. Baruch Atadonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei Peri HaAdama Amen. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the earth. Amen. Let us dip the parsley into the salt water and eat the Karpas. Now we come to the part of the service known as the four questions. The scriptures tell us in Exodus 12, verse 26, that we are to be ready with a response when our children ask us why we are having this service. A tradition has been developed to ask a young person at the Seder to ask four questions that help us to explain this service to our children. So now we are going to have uh, Eli come up and help us with this part of our service. Why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights, we eat bread or matzah. On this night, why do we eat only matzah? On all other nights, we eat all kinds of vegetables. On this night, why do we eat only bitter herbs? On all other nights, we, dip, we do not dip our vegetables. On this night, why do we dip them twice? On all other nights, we eat our meals sitting or reclining. On this night, why do we eat only reclining? Thank you. Excellent. Now we will answer the four questions of Passover as we seek to better understand the mighty works of our faithful God. The first question concerns the matzah, the unleavened bread. On all other nights, we eat bread with leaven. But on Passover, why do we eat only matzah? The unleavened bread reminds us that our people were instructed in Shemot Exodus 12, verse 11, to eat the first Passover in haste, ready to be delivered by the Lord's uh, stretched out arm from their bondage in Egypt. As the children of Israel fled from Egypt, they did not have time for their dough to rise. Just as Messiah was unleavened or without sin, we are instructed to keep the feast without leaven. We are to keep it in sincerity and truth as we read in the New Covenant Scriptures in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 6 through 8, which says, Your boasting is not good. Don't you know the saying, it takes only a little comets to leaven a whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old comets so that you can be a new batch of dough because in reality you are unleavened. For our Passover lamb, the Messiah, has been sacrificed. So let us celebrate the Seder, not with leftover comets, the comets of wickedness and evil, but with the matzah of purity and truth. During this season of Passover, may we purpose to break our old habits of sin and self-centeredness and begin to live fresh, new, and God-centered lives. At this time, each of the, uh, those who are participating will take the matzah and uh, break off a piece so that everyone is able to get a small piece of matzah, which we'll, we will be eating all by itself in just a moment. But first, we need to say the traditional blessing before we eat the matzah. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher shanu mitzvotav, vitzivanu achilat matzah. Amen. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by thy commandments, 
and com has commanded us to eat unleavened bread. Amen. At this time, let us all partake of the matzah. Three pieces of matzah or matzot in the plural are wrapped together for Passover. There are various explanations for this. The rabbis call these three a unity. Some consider it to be a unity of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Others explain that it is a unity of worship, the Kohanim, the priests, the Levites, and the people of Israel. We who know Messiah can see in this a representation of the mysterious triunity of God. Though he is one, it is a composite unity. He is Father, Son, and Spirit, three in one. If we want to see the triune nature of God in the Tanakh, it can be seen most clearly in Isaiah, Yeshiahu, chapter 48, verse 16, which reads, Come ye near unto me, hear ye this. From the beginning I have not spoken in secret. From the time that it was, there I am, and now the Lord God hath sent me and his Spirit. Because of the messianic interpretation of the three pieces of matzah, the rabbis sought to remove them from the Seder. But it remains they've been unable to, uh, to do that, and the three matzah remain a traditional part of the Passover Seder today. Now, <clears throat> we take out the middle piece of matzah at this time. And in the matzah, we can see a picture of Messiah. First of all, we can see that it is striped. In Yeshiahu, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, we read, But he was wounded because of our transgressions, he was crushed because of our iniquities. The chastisement of our welfare was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Also, if you hold it up to the light, you can see that the matzah is pierced, just as our Messiah Yeshua was pierced. In Yochanan John chapter 19, in the New Covenant Scriptures, we read in verse 34, One of the soldiers stabbed his side with a spear, and at once blood and water flowed out. And three verses later, in verse 37 of John 19, John reminds us that this is a fulfillment of a scripture in the Tanakh. He writes, and again, another passage says, they will look at him whom they have pierced. This refers to Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, which says that one day our Jewish people will acknowledge the pierced Messiah, the one who had his spear thrust into his side. Uh, the verse says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they shall look upon me because they have thrust him through, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is, is in bitterness for his firstborn. Traditionally at this point in the Seder called Yachatz, the middle matzah is broken in two and wrapped in a cloth to be hidden and brought back later in our Seder. I have a fancy pouch for wrapping what is now referred to as the afikoman. Just as the middle piece of the bread of affliction is broken, Messiah too was afflicted and broken. The afikoman is wrapped in a white cloth just as Messiah's body was wrapped for burial. I will soon hide the afikoman, uh, is what would normally happen at a Seder. And uh, the way that I get it back is it has to be redeemed. I have to pay to get it back. Just as the afikoman is hidden, so Messiah was placed in a tomb and hidden for a short time. Later, the afikoman will be brought forth to conclude our Passover Seder. 
so too Messiah was raised from the, from the dead to ascend back into heaven that our redemption from sin might be complete. Now the part we all look forward to, the maror, the bitter herbs. Some actually enjoy this. Others uh, just kind of go through the process to uh, accomplish what the scriptures tell us to do as maror is one of the foods uh, we are told to eat at this time. Once again, we will all be eating another piece of matzah, but this time with burger, bitter herbs on it. Uh, keep in mind that some years the maror can be fairly strong, so you want to keep that in mind. Uh, but <clears throat> we'll find out what is the case as we try some tonight. The second, uh, uh, <clears throat> depending on how strong it is, there are some who think that this may be the origin of spring sinus cleaning. Uh, so we will have to see uh, how that turns out. The second of the four questions was, on all other nights, we eat all kinds of vegetables, but on Passover, why do we eat only maror, bitter herbs? The traditional Jewish answer to the second question is, as sweet as our lives are today, it is important for us to remember how bitter life was for the children of Israel in the land of Egypt. Also, as I suggested earlier, the scriptures tell us to eat the bitter herbs at Passover in Shemot, Exodus 12, verse 8, and Numbers chapter 9, verse 11. We read in Exodus 1, verses 13 and 14. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard service, in mortar and in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. After we say the blessing, we will eat maror. Let us allow the bitter taste to cause us to shed tears of compassion for the sorrow that our ancestors knew thousands of years ago. This is the one time of year that I eat this food. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kedushanu b'mitzvotam, Vitzibanu al Akilat Maror. Amen. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by thy commandments and commanded us to eat bitter herbs. Amen. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> we won't do that. And so at this point, you can eat of the maror if you haven't already. And then we come to the charose. Uh, the third question was, on all other nights, we do not dip our vegetables even once. Why tonight do we dip them twice? We have already dipped once when we dipped the parsley into the salt water. Now we will dip our vegetables a second time. On the spoon, I have some karoset. The children of Israel toiled to make treasure cities for Pharaoh, working with brick and clay. Traditionally, we remember this task in a mixture called karoset, or some Jewish people pronounce it karosis. Either way, it is to remind us of the mortar that was made to be used with the bricks. However, one of the reasons we talk about the other pronunciation, you have to make sure that you don't eat too much karosis at Passover, Otherwise, you might end up with harosis of the liver. Um, <clears throat> Harosid is made from chopped apples, honey, and nuts, uh, and it tastes a lot better than the bitter herbs, so there is a danger of eating too much. Let us once again scoop some bitter herbs onto a small piece of matzah, but this time before we eat, we will dip the herbs into the sweet harosid. We dip the bitter herbs into karosa to remind ourselves that even the most bitter of circumstances can be sweetened by the hope that we have in the Lord. Let us all eat of the karosa and maror.
might need milk instead of just water. Uh, maybe that only works with hot peppers. Okay. The fourth question was, on all other nights we eat either sitting or reclining. But why tonight do we eat reclining? Note that we just read that Yeshua and his followers were reclining according to Mark chapter 14, verse 18. This is because the first Passover was celebrated by a people that were enslaved in Egypt. We recline tonight as a symbol of our freedom. Let us proclaim together, once we were slaves, but now we are free. Okay, our pillow that symbolizes our reclining is what we tend to have in our chair uh, to remind us of our freedom, our ability to relax and to eat uh, at a comfortable pace. According to Shemot Exodus 12, verse 11, the children of Israel were instructed to eat the Passover in haste with their loins girded, their staffs in their hands, or their staffs or their staves, their sandals upon their feet, awaiting departure from the bondage of Egypt. Today, we all may recline and free, uh, freely enjoy the Passover Seder. Pillows are frequently placed in chairs, allowing comfort and reclining to emphasize the freedom we currently enjoy. There is a third food that we are instructed to eat as part of the Passover, according to Shemot, Exodus 12, verse 8. We had the matzah and the unleavened bread. Uh, I'm sorry, the matzah or unleavened bread, also the maror or bitter herbs, uh, and the other uh, food that we are instructed to eat is the Passover lamb. Now, some traditional Jewish people no longer eat lamb at Passover. The sacrifice of the lamb can no longer be performed without a temple. Many Messianic Jewish people do not eat lamb at their congregational Passover seders. Some don't do this based on Messiah fulfilling the role of the lamb. Others because lamb can be rather expensive. The shank bone is traditionally called the zeroah, uh, which is the same Hebrew word we find in Shemot Exodus chapter 6 verse 7 describing how the Lord would redeem his people with a stretched out Zeroah, a stretched out arm. Zeroah is also the term for the suffering servant of Yeshiahu, Isaiah 53, used in verse 1 of that chapter, which says, Who would have believed our report, and to whom hath the Zeroah, the Zeroah, the arm of the Lord, been revealed? We will now take note of some interesting aspects found in the selection of the Passover lamb, according to Shemot, Exodus 12, verses 3 through 5, which says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household be too little for a lamb, then shall he and his neighbor next unto his house take one according to the number of the souls. According to every man's eating, ye shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now what I really want us to focus on in these verses is the progression of the lamb. In verse 3, the children of Israel were to select a lamb. The Hebrew word is seh. Then in verse 4, it becomes the lamb, hasa in the Hebrew. And in verse 5, it is described as your lamb. Literally, the Hebrew says, shall be yours, yiye lachem. The roasted shank bone is what is used today to represent the lamb whose blood was used to mark the door frames of the houses of the children of Israel, signifying their obedience to God's command. We are reminded by the shank bone of the lamb whose sacrifice brought deliverance to God's people from the angel of death as he passed over the Israelite houses on that night long ago. Like the lamb, Yeshua was examined as he came to the temple every day, appearing before the chief priests and elders prior to Passover. They heard him teach, and they asked him several questions. He was examined just as the Passover lamb is examined for four days prior to its sacrifice, so that it can be verified to be without blemish, according to Exodus 12, verses 3 through 6. The Lamb of God, Yeshua the Messiah, became your Lamb and was sacrificed for your sins,
following the determination that he was without blemish. No fault could be found in him, either by the chief priests or the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, who, according to Yochanan, John 18, verse 38, said, I don't find any case against him. Some people think Yeshua's final Passover took place after the lambs had been sacrificed in the temple. Others think that he observed an earlier Seder or some similar type of meal so that his death could occur at the same time that the lambs were being slaughtered. Regardless, several times, as in Luke 22, verses 8, 11, and 15, Yeshua said that he desired to eat the Passover with his disciples. Actually, through God sending Yeshua to earth to be born of a Jewish young woman, Yeshua fulfilled the role that the rabbis refer to as Mashiach ben Yosef, the Messiah, son of Joseph. In this role, Yeshua observed these appointed times while he was alive and fulfilled them through his death, entombment, and resurrection. During the Feast of Passover, which is to be observed on the 14th of Nisan, according to Vayikra, Leviticus 23, verse 5, Yeshua became our Passover lamb through his sacrifice on the execution stake. As our unrisen, sinless Messiah, he was placed in a tomb for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which starts on the next day, the 15th of Nisan, according to Leviticus 23, verse 6. And Yeshua also fulfills the next appointed, uh, next appointed time, or Moed, of Leviticus 23, what is often referred to in the English as first fruits. Leviticus 23, verse 10 says, When ye are come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, ye shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. According to Leviticus 23, verse 11, the first fruits, first fruits offering of the barley harvest was to take place on the day after the weekly Sabbath, which would have been the day after the weekly Sabbath following Passover. Yeshua also fulfilled first fruits through his resurrection on this day. Yeshua's resurrection is actually described in the New Covenant Scriptures as being the first fruits of those who have died, according to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. Tonight we remember. Not only Messiah's death, not only the sacrifice of Yeshua, the sacrifice that brings forgiveness for our sins, but we also celebrate his resurrection, knowing that as believers in Yeshua, we too will one day be resurrected to spend the rest of eternity in the presence of our Creator. Hallelujah. Uh, it's hard to not get excited reading those words. Uh, it is also on first fruits that the count begins toward the next appointed time of the Lord, Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. And because of the 50-day count to that day, this day is sometimes called Pentecost, which means 50 days in the Greek. As with the first three appointed times, Yeshua fulfilled the fourth appointed time, Shavuot, by sending the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, on that day, as we can read about in Acts chapter 2. Numerous Tanakh and New Covenant scriptures predict Messiah's return. According to Zechariah chapter 14, this is when he will deliver God's chosen people from the hands of their enemies. And then he will set up his kingdom in Jerusalem, where he will rule and reign as the ultimate son of David. As a result, we also expect that he will fulfill the final three appointed times, the fall feasts, of Leviticus 23 upon his return to be the one the rabbis call Mashiach ben David, Messiah, son of David. A roasted egg has been added to the Seder. It is called the Chagigah, a name signifying the festival offering. The festival of Matzah, unleavened bread, which uh, begins tonight at sundown, was one of the three times when all Israelite males were supposed to come to a place of the Lord's choosing, according to Devarim, Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16. At first, this would be the tabernacle, and later it would be the temple in Jerusalem. According to this verse, they were, required, they were also required to bring an offering. They were not to appear before the Lord empty-handed. So at this time, we would ask, if you are led of the Lord, you can provide an offering to our ministry, through PayPal on our website, www.adonalum.org. 
where you can seek the Lord to see if he would have you perhaps give an extra gift to a ministry that he would bring to your mind uh, in the coming days as an alternative. Perhaps it might even be a different messianic ministry or another ministry with outreach to our Jewish people. We have a place on our website where you can find recommended messianic ministries of this type. The egg is also a food traditionally associated with mourning in Judaism. Since the shape of an egg represents, uh, it, the shape shows no beginning or, or no end, uh, it comforts us as a reminder that there remains the hope of new birth and life in the olam haba, the world to come. Now, what would we be mourning? Since 70 uh, CE or AD, the Jewish people have mourned the destruction of the temple. And now we come to the Magid, the retelling of the story of the Exodus. It is a story of miracles, of redemption, of the mighty power of God to overcome evil and the great love of God to redeem his people. The Lord had promised the land of Israel to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, yet their descendants had moved to Egypt during a famine and had remained there for many generations. The Pharaoh, who had come to power, feared the Israelites because God had blessed them with strength and numbers. He was afraid that during a war they might join with his enemies and overpower the Egyptians. Pharaoh decided to enslave the Israelites, forcing them to work under cruel taskmasters, building cities for him. He further decided to keep their numbers low by ordering that all of the baby boys be thrown in the river. One Israelite couple hid their little boy for three months then placed him in a basket covered with tar and put it in the river. Pharaoh's daughter found him and decided to raise him as her own son. She named him Moses meaning to draw out of the water. When Moses grew up, he saw the burdens and afflictions of his people. One day, he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew slave. So he killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. When Pharaoh heard about this, he wanted to kill Moses. So Moses escaped from the Pharaoh by fleeing to the land of Midian. It was while he was in Midian, tending sheep, that God spoke to him from a bush that burned with fire and yet was not consumed. God told Moses that he had seen the afflictions of his people and heard their cries. He sent Moses to bring the Israelites out of Egypt and back to the land that he had promised to their forefathers. Reluctantly, Moses agreed to take God's message to Pharaoh, let my people go. God told Moses that Pharaoh would not let the people go, but that God would smite Egypt with wonders, and after that, the Israelites would be allowed to leave. God sent plagues one by one, yet with each plague, Pharaoh hardened his heart. The Egyptians became afflicted with discomfort and disease, pain and suffering. Still, Pharaoh would not relent. With the tenth and most dreadful plague, God pierced through the hardness of Pharaoh's heart. God spoke to Moses and told him to tell the congregation of Israel that they should take a one-year-old male lamb without blemish for each household. On the fourteenth day of the month, they were all to kill their lambs at dusk. The blood of the lamb was to be applied to all to sides and top of the door to the house as a sign of their faith that God would save them when he judged the Egyptians. The Israelites were to eat the lamb roasted with fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They were to eat it quickly and their traveling clothes and shoes on and their staves in their hand so that they would be ready to go. God said, for I will go through the land of Egypt in that night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood on the doorposts of their houses was an indication of their faith. God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and there shall no plague be upon you to destroy you. When I smite the land of Egypt, 
We are reminded by Moses that it was the Lord himself who redeemed the children of Israel from slavery. So the Lord brought us up of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm, with great terribleness and with signs and with wonders. Thank you, readers. And now we come to the second cup. And we will all say together, I will deliver you from their bondage. Moses left the wilderness to return to Pharaoh's palace, the very place where he had been raised. He returned with the message that the Lord had given him. But God himself warned Moses of the resistance that he would encounter in Exodus chapter 7, verses 3 and 4. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. But Pharaoh will not hearken unto you, and I will lay my hand upon Egypt and bring forth my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. Those signs and wonders were the ten plagues. The term plague certainly takes on greater significance in our lives today. And though these plagues impacted the Egyptians, God's people were protected from them. Lord, we ask your protection from this plague that you would protect your people this day. As we recite each plague three times, let us dip our little finger or a spoon into the second cup, allowing a drop to fall onto our plate, reducing the fullness of our cup of joy this night. I will take the second cup, I will take a spoon, and we'll recite each plague three times. Blood. Blood, blood. Frogs, frogs, frogs. Gnats, gnats, gnats. Flies, flies, flies. Cattle disease, cattle disease, cattle disease. Boils, boils, boils. Hail, hail, hail. Locusts. Locust, locust. Darkness, darkness, darkness. Death of the firstborn, death of the firstborn, death of the firstborn. Dayenu, it would have been sufficient. How great is God's goodness to us. For each of his acts of mercy and kindness, we declare Dayenu, it would have been sufficient. At the end of each of the following statements, let us say, Dianu. If the Lord had merely rescued us, but had not judged the Egyptians, Dianu. If he had only destroyed their gods, but had not parted the Red Sea, Dianu. If he had only drowned our enemies, but had not fed us manna, Dianu. If he had only led us through the desert, but had not given us the Shabbat, Dianu. If he had only given us the Torah, but not the land of Israel, Dianu. But the Holy One, blessed be he, provided all of these blessings for our ancestors, and not only these, but so many more. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, who has in mercy supplied all of our needs. You have given us Messiah Yeshua, forgiveness for sin, life abundant, and life everlasting. Hallelujah. We will now sing the traditional Passover song, Dayenu. The last verse we will sing is a Messianic edition. If God had rescued us from Egypt, merely rescued us from Egypt, we thought that would be sufficient, Dayenu. Die, die. 
goodbye to you singers. Now let us say the blessing over the second cup. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'ulam, borei peri ha'gafen. Amen. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Amen. Let us now drink the second cup. Now this is the time, if you are serving a Passover meal, uh, this is the time when it would be eaten. If you are going to serve dinner now, you can pause the video, and then you can pick right up on the video uh, after you have eaten. Otherwise, we are just going to continue uh, with this service. And normally, by way of announcements, uh, in the next few months, we would have services to observe a number of important days on our calendars. First will be Yom HaShoah, uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day. We also would be observing Israel Independence Day, uh, Israel uh, Memorial Day, Jerusalem Day, and the Feast of Weeks, or Shavuot. If we are unable to meet for any of these services because of this virus, our current plans are to video them, as we have been doing, so that you will still be able to experience our observance of these special days in the life of the Jewish people and for many in the body of Messiah. Well, if we had hidden the Afikoman, it would be time to have the young people uh, begin their search for it. When I was growing up, couch cushions and anything else that wasn't nailed down would go flying as the 10 grandchildren would search the house looking for the Afikoman, which was always hidden somewhere that it was just barely visible. Under the circumstances tonight, we will just bring the Afikoman back so that we may uh, continue our Seder. As we share the Afikoman, we are uh, reminded that it is to be the final food eaten at Passover. Afikoman is the only Greek word that is used in the traditional Passover observance. Additionally, the Afikoman was not a part of the Passover observance in Yeshua's day. The last solid food to be eaten in his time would have been the Passover lamb. But rabbinic tradition holds that the Afikoman now represents the lamb and therefore everyone must eat of it. Since it is not Hebrew in origin, there is also much debate among rabbis concerning the meaning of the word afikomen. The majority of the rabbis have concluded that the best translation would be that it means that which comes last, or dessert, since it is eaten after the meal when a dessert would normally be eaten. Unlike Hebrew, Greek is much more definitive when it comes to tense. The word afikomen is used in a tense that requires completion of an action. While it is sometimes translated as he who comes after, it can also be translated as a completed action, he came. It is shared as the Passover lamb was shared from the time of the Exodus until the destruction of the temple. And the rabbis tell us that the taste of the afikomen should linger in our mouths. So if we were uh, having our regular Seder, each person at their own table would take a piece of the afikomen. Yeshua compared himself to the manna that God provided for our ancestors in the wilderness and called himself the bread from God, the bread from heaven, and the bread of life in Yochanan John chapter 6, verses 33 through 41. He was also born in a town called the House of Bread in English, Beit Lechem in the Hebrew. Bethlehem is how uh, the city name is actually uh, pronounced in the English. At his last Passover, we read that Messiah broke the unleavened bread and then gave thanks to the Lord. So let us give thanks for the afikomen with the traditional blessing for the bread. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, ha'motzi lechem min ha'aretz. Amen. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Amen. After saying the blessing, Yeshua added these words as we read in Luke 22, verse 19, This is my body, which is being given for you. Do this in memory of me. If you do not believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, we invite you to experience the Afikoman as part of the traditional Jewish Seder. But if you believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, we invite you to taste the afikomen 
as you contemplate the sacrifice of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So let us now all partake of the Afikoman. The third cup, the cup of redemption. Together, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. This is the cup of redemption symbolizing the blood of the Passover lamb. It was the cup after supper with which Messiah identified himself. In Luke 22, verse 20, Yeshua said, This cup is the new covenant ratified by my blood, which is being poured out for you. Just as the blood of the lamb brought salvation in Egypt, so the sacrifice of Messiah Yeshua can bring salvation to all who believe in him. The prophet Isaiah, Yeshiahu Hanavi, reminds us in chapter 59, verse 1, The Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. The Lord's hand is Isaiah's description of the Lord's redemptive power through the Messiah. It is our own righteousness that falls short. Isaiah 59, verse 16 tells us, And he saw that there was no man, and was astonished that there was no intercessor. This is remedied in the rest of the verse, which says, Therefore his own arm, his Zeroah, brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness, it sustained him. The third cup is also symbolic of the cup of betrothal that was shared when a young man and a young woman agreed to be married. A down payment had to be made by the young man, and the father of the young woman had to accept this down payment. Yeshua offered his life for his bride, the body of believers made up of both Jews and Gentiles. So all who would eat the symbolic bread and drink the symbolic fruit of the vine agreed to become one with Yeshua and to be his bride. So if you wish to identify with what Yeshua did for you, you too can become a part of the bride and can have the assurance that you will spend all of eternity with your creator. So let us bless the third cup, the cup of redemption. Baruch Atadonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Borei Peri Hagachen Amen Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Amen Let us together gratefully drink of the cup of redemption. Yeshua took the symbolic elements of a traditional Passover Seder and inaugurated the final covenant renewal that was promised to the Jewish people in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a brief Kadashah, a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their, fa their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for as much as they broke my covenant, although I was a Lord over them, saith the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put Torah T in the Hebrew, my Torah, my instruction in their inward parts, and in their heart will I write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and, I will rem and their sin will I remember no more. It was in the midst of keeping the Passover that Yeshua inaugurated this final covenant renewal, as prophesied by Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah. Today we remember this event through an observance that the body of believers calls the Lord's Supper. We who accept the new covenant are no longer condemned by our inability to keep the law of Moses. But we find it fulfilled by our Messiah Yeshua as we have discussed this evening and as Yeshua says in Matit Yahu, Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Don't think that I have come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to complete. Yes, indeed, I tell you that until heaven and earth pass away, not so much as a yud, the smallest letter, 
or a stroke will pass from the Torah, not until everything that must happen has happened. Shortly, we are going to give anyone who has not previously accepted Messiah's sacrificial atoning death on their behalf an opportunity to do so. God wants a relationship with his creation, but God is holy and righteous, and we are imperfect, unable to meet his standards. God revealed clearly in the Torah that a blood sacrifice was required for our sins to be forgiven. Leviticus 17, verse 11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh atonement by reason of the life. No one, no one, whether Jew or Gentile, can have his sins forgiven unless the appropriate Sacrifice without blemish sheds its blood and has it sprinkled upon the altar. Yeshua says in Matthew, Matichahu chapter 5, verse 20, For I tell you that unless your righteousness is far greater than that of the Torah teachers and Pharisees, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. The Pharisees exemplified human, religious, uh, human righteous works because they spent most of the day working at it. Isaiah describes human righteousness as a polluted gar garment or filthy rags because perfect righteousness cannot be achieved through human effort. It can only be obtained based on the sacrifice of the one who was perfect, Messiah Yeshua. Will you accept the sacrifice of Yeshua as your Passover lamb tonight? Messiah was examined and determined to be without blemish. The charge above his head on the execution stake said, king of the Jews. His death sentence was carried out by Roman means, crucifixion, for a violation of the laws of Rome. So I would ask, will you apply the blood of the sacrificed lamb, Yeshua, to the doorposts of your heart tonight? Will you turn back to your creator and acknowledge that you are willing to do things his way instead of man's ways? You can know for certain from this day forward that your sins can be forgiven. If you're Jewish, you'll be more Jewish than you ever were. At least that's what happened to me. If you're not Jewish, that's okay. Messiah came to be a light for the Gentiles also. I would just encourage you to say this prayer uh, if you want to accept the sacrifice that Messiah Yeshua provided and you have never uh, said this before. God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob, Lord, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. As I ask Yeshua into my life right now, I accept his sacrifice on my behalf. As I know that he was unleavened, he was without blemish, and I believe that you raised him from the dead on first fruits as you gave him victory over death. Lord, I thank you for forgiving my sins, for cleansing me from all unrighteousness, and giving me new life in Messiah Yeshua. And I ask these things in his name. Amen. The scriptures tell us in Matthew 10, verse 32, that he will confess us before the Father if we are willing to confess him before man. So if you said that prayer and meant it for the very first time, I'd like, you to, like to ask you to contact me by email through our website or talk to someone you know in leadership at a congregation. Over here, we uh, are going along with the tradition to provide a cup for Eliyahu, Elijah, at the Seder table based on Malachi chapter 3, verse 23, or chapter 4, verse 5. Uh, the no verse numbering depends on the translation. But the verse says, Behold, I will send you Eliyahu, Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers. This cup is for Elijah the prophet, Eliyahu Hanabi. At this time, we would even ask one of the young people to open the door so that we might welcome Eliyahu to our Seder. We've done this every year. Uh, who knows? This might be the year that Eliyahu comes. Uh, if he doesn't, then we say another Passover has come. But where is Elijah? Elijah did not see death, but was swept up to heaven by a great whirlwind in a chariot of fire. It has been the hope of Jewish people that Elijah would come at Passover to announce the Messiah, son of David. 
before the birth of John the Immerser, Yochanan Hamadvil. An angel told his father, Zechariah, in Luke chapter 1, verse 17, he will go out ahead of Adonai in the spirit and power of Eliyahu, Elijah, to turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready for Adonai a people prepared. Later, Yeshua spoke of John, saying in Matthew, Matityahu chapter 11, verse 14, Indeed, if you are willing to accept it, he is Eliyahu, whose coming was predicted. It was this same John who saw Yeshua and declared, Look, God's Lamb, the one who is taking away the sin of the world. John chapter 1, verse 29. Now we will sing Eliyahu Hanavi. singers. Now we come to the fourth cup, the cup of praise. Together, I will take you to me for a people, which comes from Shemot, Exodus chapter 6, verse 7. It was prior to this cup that Yeshua said as recorded in Matthew 26, verse 29, I tell you, I will not drink this fruit of the vine again until the day I drink new wine with you in my Father's kingdom. Let us lift up the fourth cup the cup of praise, and give thanks. Baruch atananai, Eloheinu melech haolam, borei pari hagafen. Amen. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Amen. Let us together drink the cup of praise. And when they had sung an hymn, they went into, out into the Mount of Olives to Gat Shimonim, Gethsemane, meaning the winepress of oils, where Yeshua said three times to the Lord, Not my will, but thy will be done. Matthew 26, verses 30 through 44. What Yeshua and his disciples most likely would have sung at the end of their Seder is known as the Hallel, which in Hebrew means praise as it does in the word, hallelujah. The hallel consists of Psalms 113 through 118. Now we invite you to join with us as we recite one verse from each of the hallel psalms. Hallelujah. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Tremble thou earth at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory, for thy mercy and thy truth's sake. I love that the Lord should hear my voice and my supplications. O oh, praise the Lord, all ye nations. Laud him, all ye peoples. O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Our Passover Seder is now complete just as our redemption is forever complete. Let us conclude with the traditional Hebrew wish that in modern times became possible once again in 1967, when Jerusalem came back into Jewish hands, that we may celebrate Passover next year in Jerusalem. L'Shana Haba'ah B'Rushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. At this time, we will officially conclude this observance with the ironic blessing the priestly blessing found in the Torah in Numbers chapter 6, 
verses 24 through 26. And we will also um, have a final uh, closing statement. So at this time, I'm going to call up Neil Bowling to pronounce the Birkat Hakoanim, the ironic blessing. And we would ask you at this time uh, to receive this blessing. You may even want to uh, stand wherever you are and bow your heads so that you might receive this blessing of the Lord. Yevrechach Adonai V'yishmarecha Ya'er Adonai Panav Elecha V'yichunecha Yisar Adonai Panav Elecha V'yasem Lecha Shalom May Adonai bless you and keep you May Adonai make his face to shine towards you and grant you his favor. May Adonai lift up his face towards you and give you his peace, his shalom. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us this Passover. We are trusting that uh, you will be protected uh, from the virus, that you will be blessed by your opportunity to uh, experience this appointed time, even if it is by video this year. And we are trusting that next year we will be able uh, to come together as a congregational family. We hope this celebration has been a blessing to you. And in closing, we say to you again, Chag Pesach Sameach, Happy Passover, and Laila Tov. Good night.